Okay, so we've we've put up the uh, the front page for a few days now and made some updates here and there, just trying to clarify things. Uh, uh, we tried to collect questions and we tried to address a lot of stuff. By now, it's finalized, but still, if there's more questions, I can at least instruct the the TAs to clarify things at the beginning of the test and stuff like that. You can also, you know, come talk to me after class and stuff, and I have my office hours as well today. Um, yeah, so uh, so we have the classroom, so so why not use it? Um, uh, I will warn you that I will not be holding a review session on Thursday. Okay, so. All right. Um, so hopefully this was all clear. Um, uh, oh, let me... Uh, so, uh, what I prepared ahead of time was uh, a few questions that uh, we've all seen before, although in some cases they were from PSO, so we hadn't necessarily discussed them together. Um, but I, want, I thought it might be beneficial to, to look at those problems again. One, because having seen it all before, uh, we know most of the moving parts of it. We know a little bit in hindsight. Um, uh, but, but two, it might be uh, helpful to, to revisit some of these things from, from this lens of either identifying sub-problems or changing... Uh, uh, the input graph, which was only made explicit a little bit more recently. Okay. Uh, is that uh, so? Okay. So the problems I had selected, um, and I have an iPad, so I can do other things. Was uh, the longest increasing mm -hmm. subsequence problem, and the extension to the the homework problem. Okay. Another was the American walk problem and the extension to the un-American walk problem. Okay, and then uh, I wanted to give an example of dynamic programming on, on trees and intervals too, besides sequences. So uh, so I chose an independent set, but it could have been dominating set or any other problem. I wouldn't have to change the slides too much. Okay, so that was the plan I had prepared. And then I can always make more space on the iPad and do other problems and stuff like that. Uh, be able to let me know. Okay, so um, okay, so so uh, start with these uh, longest increasing subsequence problems. So we'll focus just really on the top part first. Uh, but you're given as input uh, an array of integers. And the goal is to find a subsequence where the numbers are strictly increasing. By now, we've seen this problem several times, even in graphs and stuff like that. So I think that that instruction is hopefully clear. OK, so all right. Um, all right, so OK, longest increasing subsequence. This is probably the roughly third or fourth dynamic programming algorithm or problem that you saw on your voyage. Um, uh, and the first two that we spent a lot of time on were uh, line breaking, which is kind of breaking things into intervals, and edit sequence. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so, so um, uh, I, I'm saying identify subproblems as a more friendly, or more descriptive uh, way of name for, for ultimately dynamic programming, really. You know, trying to figure out how to take a problem, break it down uh, efficiently into small steps uh, that, on one hand, is going to be very reliable, it's going to be correct, and hopefully it'll be relative, depends on the problem, of course, but in many cases it's more straightforward to see it's correct if you have a good top-down point of view. Uh, and the other is whether you're kind of the, the sub problems are organized, um, you know, efficiently so outcomes of polynomial time. Okay, but you guys know that this is a 
a dynamic programming problem. So, so what is the, um, the, the, the first step that I always do uh, for this kind of problem? Is I, is I really do try to write out that sentence uh, every single time. And so I would look at a problem like this. And again, maybe you guys are so comfortable with this problem, but we'll, we'll use the same approach on a slightly trickier, even an odd, and, and see that it is a robust approach. So this is going to warm up to the next one. So, uh, yeah, so the first step from my point of view of any of these problems is to write out a sentence, okay? And, and sometimes my first stab is almost copying the problem. Okay, so the problem asks for a longest increasing uh, subsequence of this array. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, my a reasonable rule of thumb is if you can add the word sub to the front of something, that gives you uh, some hope of breaking down a problem. So I might think uh, sub arrays and stuff like that. There's a couple different ways to do sub arrays, but maybe the first one that would come to mind is the rest of the array, or maybe the second one that would come to mind. Okay. So, so, uh, yeah, so we have this input A of numbers, right? I just want to bite it, break it down to, to size. You know, a natural idea is maybe subproblems defined by suffixes of the array. That starts to break things down. Other alternatives, for example, something that comes up in the palindrome problem, subproblems look more like this. Okay, so, um, uh, so so what I what I what I typically do is uh, I, I just make an acronym that sort of helps me remember what's going on. Uh, so I, I think for this one, I've often used LIS, longest increasing subsequence. Okay, and I think. A very natural first attempt at this uh, might be to say, uh, I'll define this as the length of the longest increasing subsequence of A, I through N. I think that would be sort of my first instinct on this problem. You guys know that this isn't uh, enough, but, but that's sort of what I do. I just try to get my bearings straight on the problem. And often my first attempt at a sentence is very close to copying down the problem. And sometimes that's enough. For line breaking and for edit distance, that was very basically that initial guess of an inductive hypothesis worked. Um, so I, uh, I take this and I see if I can figure out how to implement it. Okay. Uh, do I give myself enough space? Okay. So, so, um, as we, as we've done together. Okay. So now, so when I'm implementing, I'm no longer... Uh, thinking as much about the original problem, but just trying to implement that sentence. Okay. I'm using that sentence as an induction hypothesis. So, uh, okay, you can address some base cases first. Uh, if i is bigger than n or something, I'll treat that as, oh, there's no numbers left in the array. So I'll write uh, zero. Okay, fine, not a, not a big deal. Uh, but then the more interesting part is, okay, there's actually numbers in the array. Okay, so I may be looking at some index i here. Okay. 
And, you know, the general principle we're trying to leverage is the idea that, you know, at some level, if I can figure out an induction step, I get a whole algorithm. At some level, if I, if I take a moment and actually kind of pretend I can solve smaller problems to solve the next incremental problem, then induction kind of takes over and will solve the whole thing for me. Right? If, I, if, I, if there was a flight of a thousand steps or something and uh, one asked, how do I get to the top of the flight of stairs? I would say, well, given a generic step stair, you take one step like this and you put both feet up or something. And that will carry you all the way through the staircase, as opposed to treating each step. So that's sort of the, the reverse then, is sort of how do I take my original problem and just bite off one small piece to something smaller that I can solve, so to speak. Okay. So it's a little bit indirect in some sense. Okay, so, so one natural idea is to say, oh, you know, whatever this number is, I can include it uh, or I won't, right? So uh, because any, whatever the solution is, it either includes five or it doesn't. Okay. So, and I know that I want to get the maximum out of the two choices. So we can write, at some level, we could figure out how to describe taking this number and then also figure out how to describe not taking AI. Okay. Um, and if you take, uh, okay, so let's say not take is maybe a little bit easier. If I choose, uh, if I say that I'm just not going to use five, then whatever the longest increasing subsequence is will also be a longest increasing subsequence of the rest of the array after five, right? Okay, so that's one way. To make the problem a little bit smaller. So that, oh, sorry, that's wrong. That's one way to make the problem a little bit smaller. It's working on a slightly smaller array. Okay, that one's the easier part. Now, on the other hand, if I take five, okay, um, you know, I do know that. Um, uh, okay, so if I take five, then it's one, and if the next number was something like uh, three, I know that can't possibly be in my longest increasing subsequence, right? So maybe a natural idea is to say skip over and maybe identify or something uh, the next longest increasing subsequence. That at least starts with a number bigger than five. At least that's what I would think. Okay. So like, okay, that's that's a possible idea. You can try to find an X index or try all the indices that are bigger than five, right? So maybe uh, I can write like uh, the maximum over all the remaining indices um, where that number is bigger. I'm going to ask you guys in a moment what's the bug. So if you if you're frowning, you should be. You know, and I don't know, try to recurse or something. Right? I mean, this is just an idea. It's flawed, right? But the, the idea is like, okay, if I take five, I should only be focusing on numbers that are bigger. So let me just scan through numbers, remaining numbers, and only the recursive stuff calls when that number is bigger. That's, that's, that's what most people do on their first attempt, including myself. But there is a there is a bug here. So this doesn't this 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 uh, yes. Yeah, so there's a bug here. It's a little bit more subtle than what we did for line breaking, where our first guess was correct. Yeah. 
Uh, what is it? Maximal? Shouldn't that be minimal? Okay, because if you say maximal, you kind of just skip to probably skip to the end of the list. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let me clarify what I mean by maximum. So that's a maximum over indices. Okay, so let me just make some. What? Oh, okay. Let me make some space. Let me write it differently. The maximum of LISJ over all indices J, that's after I, so later in the array, where that number was bigger than the one I'm looking at now. Okay, so this might be a choice. That might be a choice, right? So this is one imperfect attempt, though, to try to encode the increasing part. Okay. So, okay, so first of all, does the handwriting slash notation slash algorithm mix, are we on this same page? No. Okay, so, okay, so let me write it out in steps. So one thing is to say, okay, let's loop over all the indices J bigger than I and only when the value is bigger than AI, then, then we'll consider one plus the longest increasing subsequence from that number on. Okay, so I'm, I'm looping over those indices and looking at the maximum of those things I run into, the qualifying points. Okay, but there is a bug here. Okay, so, okay, so at some level, we should we should pay attention to. The sentence at play. Okay, so let's say the number after seven is smaller. I'm not really supposed to take four. All right. So, at some level, it is clear that seven should be a candidate number to go go next. That's what my mind thought when I proposed this idea. But the sentence is saying, you know, what is the longest increasing subsequence of a i through n? So that's saying, okay. You know, what is the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting from 7? Right? I mean, where the input starts from 7. But that longest increasing subsequence doesn't necessarily have to use 7. Possibly, whatever the solution is for that subproblem, if it looked like uh, uh, maybe this was uh, a 5 or something. Okay. If I were just looking at the longest increasing subsequence starting from the 7 and just trying to find the longest one of that, then 4 and 5, well, will be worth at least as much as 7 and 9. Okay, so not a perfect example, but if the next number down here going off the page was uh, 6. Okay, so 4, 5, 6 will be the longest increasing subsequence for that subproblem. In this input, okay, um, and that's what my sentence is trying to do, right? My recursive spec would say uh, the length of the longest increasing subsequence of that subarray starting at seven is four, five, six. Well, four, five, six isn't what we want because that would have been a number smaller than five. Okay, so. While this was uh, the natural thing to try, the sentence somehow wasn't necessarily strong enough because in that subproblem, I don't actually have much control over where the sequence starts. I'm really looking for sequences where everything is larger than five as well for that subproblem. Okay? But that's not encoded 
in my sentence. Any questions on that point? Okay. So, so then I say, okay, I need to do a better sentence, a stronger sentence to somehow encode more information. Okay? Which in particular gives me a more reliable and kind of a stronger induction hypothesis to work with. Okay. All right. So, okay. So if I asked, and there's, there's several different ways to do it. Um, I put one way uh, in the notes, but um, what are, does anyone want to suggest a sentence that's going to be similar, but a little bit more specific and Yeah. Uh, provide like a base to start the longest increasing subsequence. Okay, so so one option is to write. Um, okay, so okay, so at some level, okay, I can try again, where I roughly write the sentence and just add what I want. Okay, so I'll write. Uh, okay, I'm probably going to need more parameters. Let me first, since we're working with five, well, we'll figure out how to turn five into a variable, but since we have that example in mind, you know, what I would have wanted is the length of the longest increasing subsequence of a i through n Okay. where all the numbers in the subsequence are bigger than, in this case, 5. I mean, that's kind of what we wanted for that particular example. Okay. Now, uh, of course, 5 is obviously a little arbitrary. More generally, we might be looking at, uh, 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 I probably don't want to just put any value there just because there could be so many values in some ways. I mean, making that table to save your answers might be a little bit annoying. But you do know you're always interested in values that came earlier in the array. So an alternative way to put this info is maybe I give you a second parameter, j, another index in the array. And so let's make sure that everything is bigger than AJ. Okay. Okay. So, so in other words, I, I see a problem. I basically first just repeat the problem in the sentence. Uh, I find it wasn't quite strong enough. But I think a little bit about what I wish I had when trying to do the recursive implementation. And that would be one idea. Okay. All right, but now if I want to implement this thing, uh, usual, the handwriting is such a mess, it takes up the entire page. Screw it. Okay. All right. So let's try to implement this. Okay. I'll just write in the base case. If there's nothing left in the array, it's just zero. Okay. All right. So otherwise, um, yeah, I'm looking at some i here, and there's some number here. At index j, I want to make sure everything's bigger. Right. Okay, so um, what are my high level options for taking one baby step? What are some ideas? So 
So we're trying to break it down into just kind of one small decision at a time. Yeah. Okay, so we can take I or not take I. Okay. Now, there are some, we can't always take I, right? So at, based on our sentence, remember we're just implementing the sentence. When can I take I and when can I not? Okay, so I do have to make sure AI is bigger than AJ if I'm going to take it. Okay, so uh, first, uh, all right, so if AI uh, is bigger than AJ, okay, then I am allowed to take AI. Okay. Uh, and as you guys said, there's basically two choices. I can either take it or not. I know the solution either takes it or not. And I'm not trying to guess, I'm not trying to actually that aggressively figure out what the whole solution looks like. Ultimately, I don't really know. It'll take, it's too much to kind of look into the future. So we just try both. Okay. So one option is uh, I take it. So I would... Uh, I get one point for taking AI, okay? And now I want to recurse, but what should I put in for the, the parameters will update. So what will be the, the parameters to the recursive call? Keep in mind the sentence that we're trying to implement. Yeah. I plus one, J. Okay. I plus 1J. So the length of the longest increasing subsequence of A I plus 1 onto the rest where all the numbers are bigger than AJ. Uh, we do need to make sure because it's increasing over time. So it will be bigger than J. I mean, we want the subproblem to be bigger than J, but we also want it to be bigger than I. Okay, so, so there, this J will be I. AI will be bigger than J, so it will also include J. It's a little bit stronger. Okay. But one thing that's nice is that this sentence, I've changed the sentence to give me exactly what I want. Yeah. Um, are you taking I or J? Uh, okay, so the... That's right. So the, it's the length of the longest increasing subsequence of A, I through N. So I can take A, I or I plus 1 or I plus 2, where all the numbers are bigger than A, J. Presumably, J is less than I, although that's not included in the sentence. Um... Okay, so what, one thing we can do is in all of our use cases, we always imagine J being less than I, some number we had already taken before. Okay, so we can, you know, define this specifically for J less than I. Okay, yes? So you're taking L and I? I am taking L and I, yeah, just rephrasing it in an annoying teaching way, yeah. Um, okay, but the key point, though, is that that first sentence, which was very close to repeating the problem, was close, but just we want to be a little bit stronger and put in a little bit more info. And then that actually made it easier to implement, even though it seems like we're doing more at some level. Right? I mean, at some level, it seems like I'm trying to implement something more complicated, but the flip side is that uh, I have more to work with on the subproblem. So actually the incremental step is coming out cleaner. Okay, okay so that's, that's how we would encode taking AI. And um, 
Move this out of the way. Uh, and how would I encode not taking AI? Yeah. Uh, that's right. So I will move on and work with the rest of the subarray. But I'm not taking AI, so AJ kind of remains that last number that's bigger than everything. Um, uh, so that's why we didn't update that one. Okay. Um, okay, and then uh, we do have one other case. If AI... I mean, it's, we've already kind of said out loud a little bit, but let's be thorough. If AI is less than equal to AJ, okay, then I know I can't take I, because the rules are it has to be strictly increasing. Okay, so I only have one option. And what would that be? In the back, yeah. Don't take it, so how would I express that? Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, so really a lot is going on at that sentence. At some level, the code is sort of testing your sentence. See if it's strong enough or appropriate to turn it into an algorithm. You get some feedback, you change something. Um, okay, so let me copy this. Okay, so does the... Okay, so one thing though is, you know, just looking at this, why is this correct? Right? And it might seem hard to believe, trying to imagine a sequence in an algorithm chasing all the way through that this is correct. Okay, but try not to think about the algorithm chasing everything all the way through. Just focus on whether you implemented that sentence correctly. Right? Just make sure you implement the sentence correctly. Uh, L-I-S-I-J, okay, that's what I claim I'm trying to implement. I can check the base case is correct. Okay. And sort of the way we walk through it, I feel very good about what we did for AI bigger than AJ, AJ and AI. Yeah. Oh. What happens if the longest increasing subsequence doesn't start at the first uh, Absolutely. Okay. So we still have to get to the point of how to solve the original problem. That's true. So two, two things left to do is uh, calculate the running time, assuming we save all our answers. And, uh, and then, uh, yes, yeah, solving the original problem. Okay. Okay. So... That's good. I'll we'll hold that for just one moment. But as far as kind of looking at this recursive algorithm and wondering if it will, you know, work through all these choices correctly, right, instead of kind of thinking about it and kind of imagining your head doing the whole thing, you just want to double check that you're implementing your sentence. And by induction, you assume you solve the subproblems correctly. And so we are really taking induction and making it an algorithmic framework. But it's very powerful uh, uh, once, uh, with a higher, when, once, once you get a little more used to it, which, which takes a while. That's totally understandable. Okay, because, I mean, it's just, it, it just so useful to uh, um, kind of be able to think from a, a top-down kind of way. You know, this is just a toy problem, but, but it's a very versatile approach that, that works in a lot of situations. If you can just figure out how to sort of take one piece off at a time. Um, uh, it's, all, it's, um, it's the hardest thing we teach and, I, and probably the most important thing we teach. This, this, I, this kind of high level idea. Um, uh, Okay, so so okay, so let's get to these um, these questions. We haven't really finished the job yet, so let me shrink this and uh, okay. Okay, is that visible? What's left up there? Okay, so 
how do I solve uh, how do I solve the original problem? So originally I wanted the longest increasing subsequence. Um, starting anywhere. And here we always have uh, this extra parameter j is always in our minds signifying some number we've already chosen or something. Right? So but where do you start then? I mean, there's, there's no number already chosen. Okay. But you do have the sentence to work with. So just assume you have all those answers. So now we're asking, how do I, having made a sentence, how do I express the original problem in the form of the sentence I made? Yeah? Would you just take LIS 0, 0, since the first one only needs to be greater than 0, and uh, you're starting with the like, first element in the array? Okay, so one thing to be careful is that, um, okay, so once I've, uh, once I have defined something, I have defined something, so, or at least at the moment, it's not clear what zero means. You know, because, oh, so J refers to the J's character in the array, uh, J's number in the array. One, first, second, third. The zero's number, well, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't have a literal interpretation. You can make a rule that uh, I, I pretend to add uh, negative infinity as the first number, and then and do something like that. That's one off. It, yeah? Um, so, assuming that the array starts at 1, goes yeah. to 10, um, can we first just run through the array in a way to find the back, to find the index that has the back lowest value, so j, and then we can make um, the initial call, which is las1, and then we check it down. Uh, so you said scan through the array and find the smallest number and start from there? Oh, okay. Well, uh, the only thing to be careful about is that uh, we did decide for clarity that I would restrict my attention to where j is less than i. So we'd at least have to go back and revisit that to do that strategy right away. Yeah? Okay, so so we, uh, we don't know the first number. As some of our, if I told you the first number, you would know how to do it. So let's say that the first number was the tenth one. I just promised it to you. Okay, so if it was the tenth, how would I say find the length of the longest increasing subsequence that starting with the tenth, I guess, in terms of our definition of LISIJ? Yeah, you can do LIS 11 comma 10, or 1 plus LIS 11 comma 10. 1 because you chose a 10th, and then from then on you're starting with 11, making sure everyone's bigger than the 10th. Okay, so that simple enough. Uh, insofar as we're comfortable with the sentence we wrote down. So all this is, a, is, is completely correlated with to what extent that's really something in the sentence we fixed. Okay. Having uh, chosen the... Now, we don't know if it's a 10, but we can guess. We can loop through all of them. I can try 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, so um, uh, we can maximize 1 plus LIS uh, I, I plus 1. Okay, so that's really saying, uh, what about the ones that start with the i's? And then continues on. Uh, and I just loop, th loop through. I, from, you know, anyone could come first. Probably not the nth, but why not? It won't change our running time. But what this is really doing is, okay, you've broken down into subproblems. Can we relate those subproblems back to the original problem? Yeah. Um, is this faster than the negative infinity solution? Okay, so let's talk about running time. As you guys know, the dynamic programming will get you n squared. There are wild ways to get n, but that doesn't matter here. So, um, okay, so 
That's true. And it's, it is possible that, yeah, so, so, okay, we'll see. All right, so, so uh, our running time is actually going to come down to two things here, just because our finding our sub problem is kind of non-trivial. Uh, if I had solved, I mean, finding, okay, so there's two steps. One is solving all the sub problems. And the second is extracting out the solution. So maybe I'll, I'll address the, extracting out the solution first, because that was the question asked, and it's a little simpler. Assuming I've already solved uh, li, sorry, LISIJ for, for all relevant i and j, how long would it then take me to extract the original solution? So I'm looping through and checking. Oh, and it's just looping through and, and looking up these values that are pre-computed. Okay, so here I'm assuming that I've already solved the LIS. I'm going backwards just because it's simpler. So, so this here is a loop of size n, where for every choice of i, I'm just looking up this value I've computed. Okay. So... Extracting out the solution after would take O n time, even though it seems kind of clumsy. It is true that uh, the infinity trick would take constant time because you only have to look up one thing. Um, uh, however, it may not be the bottleneck anyway. It's unlikely that we'll do the rest of the algorithm faster than O n, of course, as we'll find out. But. So the answer is yes, but maybe it's not such a big deal. Uh, maybe, maybe, yes, it is slower, but it's still linear time. Um, okay, so, uh, and, and it's, uh, I, can, I can't even think of an example where extracting out the solution takes longer than solving all the subproblems. Uh, so, uh, that's common. Now, let's figure out how long it takes to solve the dynamic programming part. Okay, so first we have to at least acknowledge somewhere that we are going to save the answers to our recursion. Because otherwise it would go on forever. It would just make all these recursive calls and it take forever. So all we're asking is just the words with dynamic programming. Just any acknowledgement that you are saving the answers. You don't have to put in any code for actually building a table and stuff like that because Basically, in all our cases, it's the same kind of mechanical procedure of allocating an array that's sort of proportional to the arguments and saving them. So you can always take one of these recursive specs and kind of mechanically wrap it. And so I'm not. Uh, so so when we say I apply dynamic programming on the caching solutions, that's now I'm plugged. Yeah, my my main focus always is just can we figure out the right way to capture the problem in terms of subproblems. That's always what I'm looking for. Okay. Now, um, as far as the running time goes, there are sort of two ways we break down the running time for dynamic programming, and one is a, kind of refines the other. The, the simplest way is just to count up the number of subproblems, and then give an upper bound on the time we spend on each subproblem, and then multiply them together. A more refined approach, and what we're really bounding, is the total sum over all the subproblems and the time spent on the subproblem. Now, sometimes when we did stuff in graphs or in trees, you know, the total number of amount of time I did was sort of it was doing a loop over the edges, incident to a vertex or something like that. When we did like longest path, I was looping over the outgoing edges or something like this. So the time to solve a subproblem for that vertex was the out degree. And the out degree is summed up to n, you know, something nice and clean. So sometimes in graphs and stuff, that second more refined approach will give you a slightly better bound than just taking the worst case of any subproblem and multiplying by the total number of subproblems. Okay. Now I think for us that's only appeared in trees and graphs, and that's mostly the case, I think. Okay. Let's focus on this. 
So here, let's let's first just do number of subproblems, or we're just going to do the number of subproblems times the time I spend per subproblem. Okay. So how many subproblems have we created? It's really the, the number of choices of parameters in that sentence we defined. So our parameters are i and j. How many choices of i times the number of choices for j? Up to a constant. Yeah? Will there be n choices for i and n choices for j? So okay. n. Perfect. So n choices for i, n choices for j, n squared subproblems. The base case is you don't have to do anything. You just return the constant right away. So. We're only interested in the interesting i and j. And how long in this implementation does each subproblem take? I can zoom in a little. Uh, make it easier. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just taking it's just you know taking uh, the maximum of two values or just returning one value. There's no loops in that code. So so this is constant time for subproblem. Okay. And so I get n squared time overall. The thing that we didn't write out explicitly was the fact that we're saving our answers. And that makes a huge difference you know, over a, a, a naive recursive implementation. OK, so it's a, it's a nice problem. Um, uh, but I thought it would be beneficial. Uh, Okay, so did that much, did that, is that okay? Yes. Um, wouldn't like, the maximize over i from one to n also add another uh, factor of n? That's right, that's right. So, so we do a, do a loop to figure out the initial solution, which takes n time, which is smaller than n squared. So overall, the running time is still n squared. Uh, n squared plus n in big O land is n squared. OK. All right, so um, OK, so yeah, for what it's worth, you know, uh, the, the solution I gave also is the there's, there's several different ways to do longest increasing subsequence. So I just want to give uh, you know, just alternative ways to think about it. Um, another option is to so before we said giving the longest increasing subsequence where everything's bigger than some fixed number which in our mind we had already kind of chosen. Uh, another option is to, another approach is to define the sentence to be the length of the longest increasing subsequence. So this is in the, in the notes, uh, where the subsequence starts with that particular number. That's also a slightly stronger sentence. Uh, and that too um, uh, makes the implementation easier. Okay, so that's another way to go about it. Okay, um, I guess I guess the and it comes out the same running time. Here I I only have n subproblems. Last time I had n squared subproblems because it was choice of i and j. Here's just the choice of i, but I still pay for it down here. Sorry, I still pay for it down here when I'm looping over all the indices bigger than i. So this would break down as n subproblems times a loop of size n for every subproblem, and I end up with n squared again. All right. So okay. So here now is the is um, uh, the trickier homework problem, but morally, 
I hope to show that there's some similarities. So the homework problem now. So often the way this problem is presented elsewhere is find the longest increasing sequence where the sum is even. As opposed to asking for even and odd. Um, But as we'll see, it's actually very helpful to try to solve the odd version as well. Okay, so that's why I also ask for odd. uh, To help break down the problem a little bit. And, okay, so I know you guys have seen uh, uh, solutions before. But, okay, so so here then is a uh, presumably more difficult problem, right? It's taking the last one and adding some bells and whistles. You have two things going on. Okay, that's sort of different. Okay. So, you know, we can take, but my, my first thought would be, we can take the sentence uh, we wrote up here. Okay, so we'll keep working off the same uh, approach. Okay. okay, so okay, so we sort of understand. At this point, we 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 uh, we have some feel for longest increasing subsequence. So this is already in my head. This sentence. And, uh, okay. Uh, But, uh, of course, there's now a mismatch between the sentence we just did and what we want. We want even and we want odd. But let's start with even. If I wanted to take this sentence and describe what I want for the even version of the problem, what can we do? First thing we can do is we can change the name. So let me call this LIS. Sorry. Let me call this LIS even. Okay. All right. How might I adjust my sentence? Okay, let's just add where the sum is even. It's a reasonable idea. We're just writing what we want. You're welcome to ask for as much as you want. You just have to then provide it in the implementation. And sort of the the uh, uh, one one uh, kind of aspect about this problem is that it's very helpful to write out sentences for both of them instead of trying to solve one by itself over the other. Okay. So all I've done is uh, copied and pasted. I'm just going to change the word even to odd. Always embarrassing to look at my own handwriting. Okay, so here are two sentences. Just trying to pattern match off of what we did for longest increasing subsequence. Okay, but um, maybe the only difference in perspective is that uh, I'm thinking in terms of uh, trying to make the sentence first, and second. Uh, being very willing to amend the sentence and add the things I need to solve the problem. I I see it as a tool. Help me understand the problem. Okay. All right, so when it comes to implementing this, let me make this...
a little bit bigger. Okay, is that legible? Okay. Um, if I wanted to implement uh, LIS even, IJ, um, then we first address the base case. If I is bigger than N, it's going to be zero. Okay, so now I want the longest increasing subsequence of a i through i a i through n, where all the numbers are bigger than some particular a j. Okay. All right, so uh, we have two possibilities. Uh, it's going to break down initially similar to last time, right? I could first check to see if a i is bigger than n or a j. If AI is smaller than AG, I can't take it anyway. So let me write that down first because that's a little bit more straightforward. Okay, I'm not allowed to take AI. So I'll look for the longest increasing subsequence that doesn't use AI. Uh, the only difference here is I'm, I'm calling even because I do want the even one. Okay. Now, okay, so now the more interesting case where we actually have some choices is where AI is bigger than AJ. Okay. So I do now have the option of taking AI although I don't have to, and I don't really know if the optimum solution takes it or not. Okay, so. Where should we proceed from here? We'll take, yeah, okay, so we want to return the biggest thing, so we're going to try a couple of different choices. One choice is uh, we take, I guess don't take is also kind of easy. It'll be like last time, the one above. So let me just fill that in. Okay. If I do want to take it, okay. so what we did last time was one plus LIS, yeah, let me just write down exactly what we did last time. Uh, I plus one I, so I want the increasing subsequence, you know, of all the remaining letters, but using AI. It seems like one natural uh, thing here is we're doing a different function now, so I'll write LIS even. Okay, so if I take it, what this is saying is I take AI, and I recursively try to find the next the biggest, uh, longest increasing subsequence that's even among everything that's left. That would be sort of exactly what we did last time with LIS replaced by LIS even. But there is a bug. Yeah. Um, I think you only do that if AI is even, and then if AI is odd, you do one plus LIS odd of that. Perfect. So. We, the, there is a little bit more bells and whistles, right? So we need to make sure the whole thing's even, which depends on AI being even. So if AI was even, if AI was 10 for 8, then I would want the rest of it to be even. Okay, so uh, again, sort of work with me. So if AI was even, Uh, I would look for the length of the the increasing subsequence uh, where everything else is even. But if AI is odd, uh, 
then instead I should write what? Okay, I need to flip the parity over. Okay. 1 plus LIS odd. Now, um, uh, to be comfortable, I mean, okay, so the, the, why, the reason why we would even think to do this, though, is by first kind of establishing some idea of what we want from LIS odd. We haven't even implemented LIS odd, uh, but we have enough of a sense of what to expect that we might be willing to use it. But it's, 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 it's a big leap if you hadn't written that sentence. Would it be clear what we're calling if just vaguely we had some sense of LIS odd? Yeah, question? Yeah. So um, our initial call for this function is more like uh, list even one zero. That is probably our initial call, right? Well, I think we would probably do the same thing like we did last yeah. time, where we move over. Yeah, so so I think the, one of the problem is, like, if we do, like, 1 and 0, we're only checking if AI, which is A1 here, is even or odd. We're ignoring the A0. Oh, okay, so, okay. So this is a question concerning... So last time, when we were figuring out how to extract the original problem, we just looped over and called LIS even, kind of based on our guess of the first number. But let's say you're trying to solve LIS even, and you're guessing, right? If your first number you're guessing is odd, then you shouldn't be calling LIS even on the rest, you should be calling LIS odd. So how to extract the subproblem will be a little bit, the principle will be the same. We can try to guess the first number, but you should be careful and flip the LIS odd if your guess is odd. But otherwise, the, the looping idea suggested earlier would be okay. Okay. Um, I'm running out of time. Um, so LIS odd, I'll only be brief and so I can talk a little bit about the other stuff. Would be implemented similarly. The only thing, one thing you have to make sure though is that if you run out of numbers, the empty sequence counts as zero, which is even. So instead of returning zero, we might return negative infinity or something to note there's really no sequence. That's even odd. But we would do something similar where based on the number I'm looking at now, I would either make my recursive call to LIS even or LIS odd. Um, yeah. Okay, so the hard part is, is identifying the subproblems. Maybe even the harder part is to, is to try to identify them first before solving the rest of the problem. Okay. Let me talk a little bit uh, about American Walk as an example of change in the input. I think here the details are a little bit less, so actually we could cover the main themes in the remaining time. Be a little less interactive. Uh, okay, so the problem we posed to you guys in, uh, in PSO, you have some kind of graph where you have red, blue, and white edges, right? So, and then I'll use gray, I guess. Okay, so you have kind of three colors of edges, and you can only do walks that are alternating red, white, blue, red, white, blue, red, white, blue. And uh, this problem is kind of funny because it's a little complicated, but it's like uh, not infinitely complicated. So you could possibly take DFS and rearrange it and open it up and turn it into like a four page version of DFS to check for reason. That's absolutely possible and a lot of people do this. 
but there's a different perspective um, which won't hurt, will be just as fast as the most clever custom-made algorithm, but it'll be much easier to see why it's correct. Okay. And you guys kind of know the trick by now. Um, okay, so we have some graph and with some vertices. But well, we sort of make three copies of the vertices. Okay. And I kind of put the ed red edges here, the blue edges here. Oh, sorry, it should be white. Well, depends on which direction you're going. Maybe the white edges here, okay. and then blue edges here. Okay, so let me draw some arrows. Imagine we're going up through this, these layers always. Sort of these pancakes. Oops, sorry. Okay, so now in the auxiliary graph, I drew the edges red just to remember it came from a red edge. But they're no longer actually annotated as red. I just know that semantically it maps to the red edge in the story. Okay. So even if you were colorblind, you can kind of look at the right-hand side. So the idea. Okay. And walks that are going up and around, up and around, up and around, are automatically forced to go red, white, blue, red, white, blue. Now, for a, it goes to a copy of a vertex, and you imagine that going to the original vertex. In the input graph, that is color. Okay. So it's, it's relatively much easier to see that you're restricted to red, white, blue, right? Because you can only go around and around. On the other hand, it's sort of easy to see that you know, any red, white, blue path or walk on one side could be mapped over to a walk on the other side, just because red will get you to one layer, white will get you to one layer, blue will get you to one layer. Okay, so you see this, and it's like, okay, that's a nice, nice trick. But what's really going on? When we think of these path problems, these distance problems, these reachability problems, probably the physical metaphor we have in our mind is a map. I think of each vertex as a location. I'm going from point A to point B. But the map point of view is, is, is a little restrictive when it comes to a problem like this. A different point of view, okay? for example, this is the point of view taken in people who do robotics or something, when they do planning problems, right? They have a robot that's in some state, its arms look like this, and it gradually wants to make the arm look like this, but it goes through a sequence of movements, a sequence of states. And they will map out, oh, here are a bunch of states from the, that the robots, the robot can go from one state to another, and this is how long it'll take, and stuff like that. Okay, so baby steps to move one robot from one position to another. So more generally, each vertex represents some kind of state. Each edge represents some kind of transition of states. It's a little bit broader than a physical location and kind of a road. Okay. Well, from that point of view, what we're really doing with this graph is we're kind of encoding memory. Okay, so being being on a vertex in this bottom layer also tells me that the last edge I took was blue. I'm sort of memory, remembering what edge I took in the construction. Okay. The vertex in the middle layer, I'm sort of remembering that the last edge I took was red, and so I know the next edge has to be white. In the top layer, I'm remembering that the previous edge was white. Okay, so I'm just kind of hacking the graph to encode extra information. Okay. Now, because this, this came up, this is a good question that came up in office hours, is that when doing, now, do you guys remember the un-American mm. version? So you're not allowed to go red, white, blue. So if you've gone red, white, your next edge better not be blue. And that's the only rule. Okay? So what... Uh, the natural idea is first to make this exact same construction. I see this often. 
make three layers. Right? That makes sense. That's where we should start from. But it's really hard to make this work because each vertex only remembers the last edge you took. Right? You can mess around and, and do a lot of stuff, but it's ultimately kind of what makes it a little tough is that when we only make three copies like this, one vertex only remembers the last edge it took. But from this point of view of states and transitions, okay, for the problem, we need to remember the last two edges we took to know which edge to avoid the next time. So that's why we can make you know, like nine copies or something, keeping track of the last two edges you took. You could be very clever and realize there's three copies that are unnecessary, but that doesn't matter too much. You can make nine copies that are, you know, red, white means my last two edges were red and white. Red, red means my last two edges are red and red. And knowing that, I know, okay, I can't take these edges or I can't take those edges next. And I can create my auxiliary graph accordingly. Okay? So that's what's going on in these change to graph columns, is that we're trying to figure out how to take this story and sort of encode that information into the graph. Otherwise, there's no analysis left. You just use DFS, you just use Dijkstra, you just use DFS or something like that. You already know what it does. It'll find you a walk if a walk exists. So the rest of the, the proof doesn't have to be very long uh, as long as that construction is, is clear. Okay. All right, so that wraps up uh, change the input. I would have talked about dynamic programming on trees and intervals as another example of subproblems. But we're out of time, but I'm always happy to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question.